Okay, so our second speaker this evening is Malcolm Miles, uh, an independent writer and researcher on critical theories of culture and society. Uh, the obvious link I found was uh, the cover of one of his books, features an image from um, He He's Project. Um, he's the author of several books, including th that one, Eco Aesthetics, Art, Literature, and Architecture in a Period of Climate Change. Uh, his next book is coming out in 2018, Cities and Literature. Um, here, he's going to explore the role of aesthetics in oblique moves towards social change. And I quote, in these dark times, threatened by climate change, struggling with precarity and social atomism, with no political light in sight, he will argue the case for aesthetics. Uh, beginning with some of Hehe's projects uh, and drawing on cultural history and theory from the 1880s to the present, the talk will offer possible formulations of an engaged eco-aesthetic and activism for the early 21st century. So I'll pass it on to Malcolm. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's very kind of you to take an old age pensioner in out of the cold. It's more interesting watching the pictures than sitting on the bus to keep warm all night, um, though that is free too. Um, <laughs> is its attraction, uh, while well, they still run them. On the train coming into Paddington, there's a big gas holder thing, and on the side of it, I noticed someone has written in very large, sort of maroon-coloured letters, DOOM. Now, I don't know if that's someone's tag, or, or they, they mean you know, it's like the end of the world is nigh, or whatever, but it seemed somehow rather appropriate for... for um, this evening and what I'm going to talk about. And I suppose perhaps I should begin simply by saying one of the things that drew me to look at Helen and Heiko's work was that I think it really does have an extraordinary aesthetic quality. Um, somebody from the floor used the word beauty, and I, I would agree, I would use that word too. Um, certainly nothing wrong with using the term beauty in talking about artworks. And it's a kind of strange, uncanny sort of quality that, you know, like green in the sky. It's not, green's meant to be in the grass and blue in the sky. Um, although I remember my, my father used to say blue and green should not be seen, as you shouldn't wear a green shirt with blue trousers anyway. But he would also only eat apricot jam on brown bread and strawberry jam on white bread. So anyway, that was, that was the kind of thing you grew up with in the 1950s. And by the 1970s, the Labour Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, got this phrase, the white heat of technology. And this was going to transform Britain, Europe, the world, the cosmos, whatever's bigger than that, I can't remember, anyway, beyond. And it was going to be amazing. And nuclear power was going to be so cheap, it wouldn't be worth metering it. So they started building nuclear reactors, and nobody asked what happens to the waste, because we didn't really know about it in those days. They haven't produced it yet. You only get waste after the event, not before the event. There wasn't any kind of preemptive waste. It was just too late. So they sent it off to um, some place called Windscale in Cumbria, which is a long way away from London, where all the power is and the newspapers and so on. And then there were a lot of leaks and rather embarrassing reports coming out about lax safety standards and how this stuff was going to last for three million years or something like that, uh, certainly beyond the life of the Labour government, which wasn't actually all that long in those days. Um, so they dealt with that very effectively by changing the name of Windscale to Sellafield, which is still there, and the <laughs> shit is still in the ground as well. And um, if you go down to Somerset, there's another one called Hinkley Point, and if you go through Bridgewater Station, so there's a little siding, and sometimes you see a couple of engines there, ready to take the nuclear flasks up to Sellafield. And I have actually seen them stop waiting for a signal in the middle of Temple Mead Station in Bristol, which is kind of quite busy. And, you know, lots of trains going through all the time. You think, well, that could be very interesting for someone who wanted to um, take over the stuff for their own purposes, shall we say, or, or if it blew up or something, there would be quite a major incident. But it just sits there waiting for a signal like any other train on our decrepit network. So, there we go. Um, it's, it's hard to know where to begin, um, but Nuage Fair seemed kind of quite a good place. Um, I was very pleased that 
He gave me permission to use it on the cover of my book, Ecosthetics. And I still, I, I, I didn't see it in Helsinki, I should explain. I've only ever seen it as an image. But I, I still think it has huge um, evocative force. Um, and it seems to me perhaps important that any kind of art that wants to contribute to some kind of better world that has any kind of utopian quality to it, if that isn't now a difficult thing to deal with. Actually, I don't think it should be. It has to have that kind of aesthetic quality in some way. There are hundreds and hundreds of ways in which it can do it. But if it doesn't have that hook, somehow draw it, compelling you to look at it, it probably won't do anything else either. So it seems to me that the installations around power stations and around fracking have this extraordinary uncanny sort of quality about them. Um, one that you didn't show was the one you did recently in Dundee, 2016, when the future was about fracking. I, I do hope we get to the point where we can say when it was about fracking, but because Blackfield has very high unemployment, and probably they all vote for the wrong people anyway, uh, they've been told that that area is going to get lots of fracking. So lots of licenses have been issued, and there's, uh, there are various websites. I think there's one called Frack Off, isn't there, where you can look up all the licenses. And they're all over the country. You may find one near you um, that you could go and protest about. But when they tried it in the prosperous southeast, in Sussex, immediately lots of people came and sat in fields and there was a camp and local people got quite involved. And uh, they sort of realised that there was money opinion forming, stuff like that going on in Sussex, which isn't far from London, um, and that maybe that was going to be not very good for public relations. But in Blackpool, or somewhere up in the northeast, um, where one of the local MPs is now <laughs> going to edit the Evening Standard, um, it's safely far away. And maybe, you know, they're poor people. They, they won't do anything. They'll be grateful for the jobs. And the fact that they have earthquakes and their water supply is totally fucked, well, they'll, have, they'll put up with it. You know, I mean, they, these are loyal subjects of the realm, I'm sure. So that's the kind of thing we're up against. And it's really difficult because almost whatever you put forward gets taken over and turned into something else. The market is adept at subsuming almost anything to its own purposes. So sustainability has become a kind of easy-to-use term. Um, there's a, an Australian architect, Alexander Cuthbert, I, I found this in a book from a conference somewhere. The very concept has been colonised by big capital and turned into another huge marketing operation to guarantee the reproduction of corporate profits. Unfortunately, there is no technical fix to the problems we now confront, which are primarily, sorry, there's a spelling mistake there, about sustainable value systems. And that's, that kind of hits the nail on the head, value systems. Because unless there's a radical change to the value system that predominates, there probably won't be very much change, except in the margins, and where it doesn't count a great deal, to the causes of climate change. And it really is getting kind of pretty serious. Uh, so... There was a map published two or three years ago, and we can't say we don't know about this. This map was published in New Scientist, which is a popular science magazine read by thousands and thousands of people. But it was also, the same week, a double-page spread in The Sun, which, for those of you who don't know these things, is a British tabloid newspaper, which is banned in Liverpool because of various things to do with Hillsborough. Um, and it is, I've, I've seen notices in bars saying no sun allowed in here, it's not welcome in here. Now, if you look at this, basically the green bits are where you can live in 2099, and the brown and yellow bits aren't, and the bits with green dots on will be solar farms, totally. There's a certain poetic justice that the, the world's two main polluters, the United States and China, will be wiped out completely, and there will be no habitable land in either of those countries according to their current borders. But there's not much comfort to all the rest of the people down in Latin America, Africa, or most of Australia, 
Um, those emerald green bits by the, oh hell, what happened there? Um, the bit of Africa and a bit of Australia, the, those, the, the kind of savagely green bits, those are heavy duty rainforest, which is not easy to live in. So it's only the green at the top and down in Antarctica and a bit of Australia and New Zealand that you can actually live in by 2099. This is the projection if we don't do anything about it. Of course, all projections like, you know, uh, polls for voting are subject to change in the course of, well, it's still a long way ahead. But it's interesting that I, uh, at conferences on art and climate change, even 10 years ago, people kept saying, well, they don't know about it. How can art tell people about it? I don't think that's a question anymore. I think people absolutely do know about it. The problem is we are so disempowered that there's bugger all we can really do about it. But there might be something. And as the people say, there is no planet B. The super-rich may have some fantasy about living on Mars. But it's a long way away. And who's going to do the washing up? And who's going to do the cooking and the vacuuming? That they haven't thought about. Maybe robots, but then who's going to service the robots? Because they're going to break down at some point or take over. So the, the super-rich, frankly, are welcome to go and try living on Mars anyway, but um, they don't take, pay tax, so why, why keep them here? A whole group of seven planets was recently discovered around the sun rather further away, all of which look like they could support life as on Earth or something approaching that. Approaching mind is quite a big word. The difficulty there is it's 41 light years away, uh, which using present technology would take 700,000 years to get to. So someone would have to go, but then they'd have to come back and tell us if it was all right. And then we could, if it worked, we could go. So that's 2.1 million years. I, I don't think it's going to happen. And actually, I don't think any of these other science engineering fantasies about you know, putting clouds of metal in the sky or whatever are really going to do the trick either. It really is quite basic. We consume too much for all the wrong reasons, and it has to stop. So a life of voluntary simplicity is probably the one thing that would make a, a real difference. So even though it might be quite nice in a way, if you remember the Vietnam War, certainly to think um, America will be a dust bowl, um, it's actually not really very nice, and it's certainly no comfort to any of the rest of us. Because if you think there's a problem with migration now, or even if you don't, because you might be liberal, then just imagine what it's going to be when five billion people from all the rest of the world try and get in that green bit across the top. Canada, England, Iceland, Scandinavia, Siberia. That, that's going to be about it. And it won't be very easy. But what happens is this term sustainability gets picked up and turned into products, or what's called greenwash. So you can have all sorts of things that are meant to be greener, which you really don't need, but you might buy them because they're green. And that, that's a huge confidence trick pulled by global capitalism to persuade you to spend your hard-earned pennies, or even pounds, on things that you think are doing the planet good. But you do need to read the ingredients very carefully. And you do need to ask, well, actually, do I need it at all? Or could I really quite reduce the range of stuff I buy? So I've got three slides of text because I, I just need to kind of establish the argument in very simple terms, and then, then we get more pictures. Um, I do also, by the way, tend to start with the doom and gloom and get a bit more happy towards the end. So I would hope to leave you on a nice, lighter note when you can enjoy the rest of the evening. And at that point, I can go and have a drink too, which would be nice. Now, sustainability, I would argue, this is purely personal, obviously, either means a radical change to the economic system known as capitalism, or it doesn't really mean a lot. And it's not a question only of dealing with what are categorised separately as green or sustainability issues. It really is quite integrated. So all the aspects of... You know, if an ecology is a system where everything works together and depends on everything else. And thinking is like that too. 
So if we're thinking about climate change, it isn't only, it, it includes things like the power stations and so on, of course, and very worrying developments in the United States to go back to coal. Um, that could be really harmful, just to the point where China is really trying to do something about it. But that's only one part of the, of the problem. And if that's looked at in isolation, we may get some marginal improvements, and that, that would be better than nothing, clearly, obviously. Um, but it won't do the trick. It won't... I don't actually believe in solving problems. That's a rather mechanistic way of looking at it. But it won't move us on to another better state to be in. So the current model of value structure that we have is a planet to be processed into profit, the residue of which will be dust, as we saw on the map. And this value system, among all the other things it does, like co-opting everything into the market and so on, like greenwashing and all the rest of it, treats people as what's called human resource. Um, the two universities represented here probably have human resource departments or something like that. And when you think about it, it's kind of, yeah, but actually, you know, these are people, they have names, and it's, you know, it's Mary and John and all the rest of it. And um, there's something about that notion of resource that is highly instrumentalist. And what I mean by that is, a rather abstract, mechanistic way of seeing cause and effect. If I want that, I can do almost anything to get there. The means deliver the end and can therefore be justified by it. So it's really a question of power relations. So I suppose, I'm kind of doing a lot of compressing and simplification here, obviously, but I think I would probably boil it down to a question of a value structure with a certain kind of power relation which is power over, not power to. And the times that this produces include, as you probably all know better than I, because I, I live in rural Devon where it's quiet and you hear blackbirds in the garden and nice things like that. Um, social atomism. We're all individuals. We all have choices, consumer choices, and we're all extremely isolated. Precarity, that this whole new gig economy of zero hours contracts and so on, people being paid minimum wage or often a lot less, very insecure employment. And for a long time, business has used various ways to produce insecurity, saying, oh God, we're in crisis, that the firm's going to go broke. That's a way of keeping people to work harder than they would otherwise. And it almost becomes a kind of tunnel vision. That the, the people are encouraged to look only towards the mechanisms, the means towards some kind of survival, rather than, well, what for? Or you know, would it be nice to jumping off Beachy Head? I mean, don't, that's not something any of you should try at home. But uh, it does get to the point, I think, that all of the humane values tend to be excluded from this instrumentalist way of looking at things. And consumerism, which is a new totalitarianism has the soft policing of the global media news entertainment sector to enforce it globally. And I think we've seen in the last few years, and particularly the last two years, the demise of the liberal reformist consensus, which sort of, in the post-war years onwards, said, well, we should try and make the world a bit better, and it will be compromised, but we should do something and we should try and move roughly in the right direction. And there should be some kind of social value. A radical form of that in the 1640s was called the Commonwealth, which is perhaps quite a, a nice concept to, to think about. And out of all this, we, we now have the distrust of not only political elites, journalism, estate agency, and so on, but also academics, probably most of you in this room who are either academics or students or artists, uh, have expertise which will be distrusted in an increasing number of quarters. But, and this is kind of another subject I'm not going to get into as such, but maybe there is actually a new kind of politics altogether in, in emerging now, which is not to do with representation. Because I can't go into this because it would take a long time, but to me somehow the concept of instrumentalism and the concept of representationalism in politics have some sort of strange connection. Uh, they seem to be mechanisms that work in similar ways but in different places. 
And I think what I mean by that is that what we've seen since, I would say since the 1960s, but it's had particular peaks and troughs, is the rise of single-issue campaigning and direct action as a personal politics outside of representation, outside of the institutions, but which is, for those who take part in it, however ephemeral it is, transformative. And I would have in mind particularly something like anti-Rhodes protest in the 1990s, um, Occupy in 2011-12, and they come and go, and they go pretty quickly. And the difficulty, I think, is that the media and politicians tend to judge them in terms of that ephemerality. Say, so, well, they failed. You know, they went away. Occupy bled all those people and they all disappeared. So what's the good of that? But I think you might look at it another way, not in terms of the programme. Political parties always have programmes which they must deliver. But in terms of the experience for those present, and I, I wasn't in Occupy, uh, so I can't speak for them, but I do remember the, the peace movement back in the late 60s, for example, where there was a particular kind of atmosphere, ambience. There was a kind of belonging which felt good, because uh, mainly people there to get away from home and various things like that, as well as whatever the cause was. And it was transformative. There was a moment, um, and I mean moment in the way that Henri Lefebvre used it in, in, in his theoretical writing, which also I don't have time to go into now, but it's his writing in the 50s and 60s, before the well-known book, The Production of Space. There's a yeah, theory of, yeah, I've got to be quick, theory of moments, which is the notion that for anyone at any time in any place, there's that sudden instant when you see clearly, oh, it's like that, ah, and this is transformative. And I think something like that probably happens in direct action. So the question is, what can art do in these dark times? So let's move on. And I want to want to outline three possibilities very quickly here, because it's not for me as a writer to say what artists ought to do, to make that very clear. And I'm not trying to establish any kind of canon or quality control of, you know, these are good projects, that, the ones I don't mention aren't. There are thousands of good projects around, and I'm being highly selective to do a fairly short talk. But I, the three headings I've got are aestheticism, exposure of contradictions, and insubordination. I'll be very brief on asceticism, because it's kind of historical. Well, it might not be, it might come back. Um, the withdrawal of artists and writers in cities like Paris in the mid-19th century, people like Baudelaire, and it goes right into the 20th century, poets like Louis Aragon, who's the other picture there, is often read as giving up. So all we do is go into our studios or our little apartments where we do our scribbling and we take our own state of psyche as the content of our work or the subject matter of our work. And yes, they certainly did do that. But I would see it as passive resistance. And I haven't got time again to go into this, but Herbert Marcuse wrote a very interesting essay on the poems of Aragon and Paul Eloi in France under the German occupation. And I'll just see what he puts forward in a sentence. A literature of intimacy, which is a romantic, like love poems literature, is the last resort of freedom in those conditions. It's like a safe house for the resistance in an occupied land. It's beyond the reach of the authorities. The regime doesn't touch that. It touches and kills everything else, perhaps. I, I take that argument very seriously. Um, actually, I wrote a book on Marcuse a few years ago, and it's, it's in there, chapter three, so please do that. But this withdrawal also produces alternative visions of society, which are pictured, for example, by Syrah. This is a sketch for the bathers in the National Gallery, 1883, which you can go and see still for free. And interestingly, right in the middle on the horizon, you'll see the factory chimneys smoking. Um, and you, you can still sort of see it. They built a bridge across from the side of the river to, to the island, the, the Grand Chat. But what's happening here is basically, it's called Holy Monday, the day when people don't go to work on a working day. Perpetual Sunday. Every day is a day of rest. Because this was anarchist thought, people like Kropotkin putting forward in the 1880s, um, 
mass production will solve the economic problem of scarcity, which will mean there's enough for everyone, and it can be produced in huge quantities fairly quickly and cheaply, and the economy will transform. Now, it didn't quite work out like that, as we know. We're, we're still waiting for uh, the economy of non-scarcity. But it does seem to me to be important, and obviously this will be reinvented in new technologies and new languages and so on. This is simply the, the painting system of the 1880s. It does seem important that there is some kind of visibility to alternatives. It's very hard to imagine something that doesn't exist. Maybe that is a place where art and literature and music can come in, that they can somehow evoke something that isn't this shit, that there might be something else that's better. The other two, then, are exposure of contradictions, which includes the notion of absurdity, and the last one we'll come on to, um, which I call insubordination, which I'm still sort of thinking about. I think this notion of exposure can go back to at least Dada, probably actually back further than that into the 19th century. But um, what I have here is a photograph of um, a cart full of people that would be taken along by a horse. Because the Berlin Dadaists um, staged mock funeral processions through the city. This is a city full of armed thugs, gangs of both right and left, but particularly the far right, the Freikorps, going around attacking people. It's when Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, two great socialist thinkers, had been murdered. Rosa Luxemburg's body was just thrown in the river. So it's a violent city. It's collapsed completely after the defeat of 1918 in the war. There has been malnutrition. And there's still food shortages. So it's a kind of... You know, it's a really upfront crisis kind of city, Berlin, around this time. So the Dardis put on these processions, which are just like the real ones, and they follow the same route, and they have a brass band playing funeral tunes. But on the way, they hand out these, or sell, actually, these pamphlets called Every Man is His Own Football. And I, I can't quite say what that means, I suppose. At least if you're your own football, you can kick yourself around instead of someone else doing it for you. I don't know where that comes from. I, I should find out, but I uh, didn't have time before tonight. So what happens here is a kind of use of absurdity to mirror it back on reality. Because reality is even more absurd than the art about absurdity. And you find that also in Samuel Beckett. Uh, or at least that's Adorno's view of Beckett in his aesthetic theory, 1969, which I'm sure you've all read. There are also more basic kinds of exposures. So, for example, during the development of London Docklands, the Art of Change put up its alternative billboards, telling another story about the Docklands development. That was uh, Peter Dunn and Lorraine Leeson. And then which gets talked about a bit more now, uh, Jeremy Deller with his film of, of the Battle of Orgreave, keeping attention on the miners' strike. And maybe we might even get an inquiry now in, into that. And I think, particularly in these very difficult times we live in, there is a need to reclaim other histories of campaigns. <coughs> Not because they were all successful, but because they happened. And because people were there who perhaps did feel differently as a result of being there. So this is Rachel Whitefleet's house in East London, but the no on the poster is actually a poster protesting against the M11 project, Claremont Road, a bit further east than this. Um, a road where lots of artists happened to have studios, living studios, so it became a very playful kind of protest. And some interesting text, one, one thing was they designated a tree as a post of address. Now, you might think because that's kind of silly, but no, because if you're the local authority and you want to cut it down to clear the space to build the road, the procedures you have to go through for a post of address are very different from those for a tree. Trees don't vote for a start. Might be nice if they did, but that, that, not a tree hugger. But these kind of playful tactics, playing with the reality in front of you, and just seeing if you can tweak it around in a rather creative way to make it very awkward, do actually delay things. 
just as the people digging tunnels, uh, you know, there's a person called Swampy, who dug tunnels at Twyford Down in, in Hampshire, who got to be a kind of celebrity in the popular press. He was even offered a recording contract, although there's no evidence of him ever having sung any song, and you know, maybe he was in his tunnels in the ground anyway. Um, so sometimes these things do take off in the public imagination, and that's good. But I wanted, um, and I'm nearly at the end of it, I wanted to mention Liberate Tate, um, a group mainly of people who were from the art world, some still in it maybe, who emerged a few years ago in collaboration with Platform, which is a London-based environmental art education group. They have a terrific website you can look up, Platform London. Um, they do a lot of work on the oil industry, particularly. But I'm just going to show two projects of Liberate Tate. Very performative, very kind of theatrical suspension disbelief stuff again. They donate, or they attempted to donate a wind turbine blade to Tate Modern for its collection. And you see them here taking it into Hearst Monk exhibitions and then in the turbine hall. It's a very big thing to come in the it's very heavy. But if you think about it, this is the epitome of modernism, the pure white object. Form follows function. Is there anything you could think about a wind turbine blade that wouldn't make it modernist? And um, what's Tate Modern supposed to collect if not modernism? So shouldn't they have accepted this? And it was being given free by these kind people who actually did all the transport for the as well, they got it right into the turbine hall. But they also wrote to Tate's membership who are influential because they pay quite a lot of money every year to the inland and take these, their income just like it needs BP's filthy oil sponsorship, which turned out to be not that much, 200 something thousand a year, but it's still money. Uh, Liberate Tate have been campaigning particularly, by the way, to, to stop take, taking oil money. Now, the gift was turned down by the trustees in the end, but there was quite a, a strong postal campaign from the membership asking them to accept it. So it actually became a really awkward issue for the trustees to deal with, because they can't tell the members to go and fuck themselves, because they've got to keep them. Um, it's really that simple. It's, it's a business decision. We've got to be quite nice to these people, but we can't be equally nice to those people who brought this thing, which of course is a perfect modernist object anyway. Um, the human cost is where in Tate Britain, in the big hall, a naked male figure lays on the floor, two black garbed, posed women with oil cans with the BP logo or something like it on the side, come and pour this black liquid over this abject thing. It wasn't actually oil, it's, a, it's like molasses or something. So it's not toxic and it washes off. So he, he is okay, don't worry. So, and, uh, and again, you may, well, you could try this at home, but um, not if you've got a new carpet or anything like that. This got on the front page of the Financial Times the next day. That's really quite important for Tate and even more for BP. The, you know, the pink paper that has all the money stuff in that counts. It was the next morning, front page picture, cash. But I will go back to the question of beauty because I think this is an extraordinarily beautiful image. Uh, but it's the beauty of objection, yes. And it does raise an important question, which I'm not going to even attempt to resolve. But does art unavoidably, inevitably beautify suffering? And does it, if it does that, make it acceptable? I don't know. I think that's probably an occupational hazard for people working in this field that you simply have to put up with. Because if the beauty isn't there, it probably isn't going to communicate a great deal either. <laughs> there are also spontaneous cases. So walking through Bristol Harbour site um, last year, I saw these two banners. <coughs> Call in sick, don't go to work. Don't work has been a big campaign in lots of anarchistic circles. And then, because lots of people did go through on the other side when you come back, you still look tired. I have to say, coming out of Houston Square Station this afternoon, going, no, I'm going to stop in and God, how we all these people look at this. Remind me of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, which talks about the crowds going over London Bridge. I had not realised death had undone so many. 
and there we are. But insubordination has a very long history, back to Greek drama, Antigone, Electra. Antigone was caught in this sort of clash of logics which tragedy usually has, not allowed to bury her brother because it's against the state law, but not to do so is against human family and religious law. So she does and is walled up and dies. But it does seem there's a very, very long tradition here that maybe can be tapped and understood and valued. So finally, do we have revolution, which must be non-violent or it's just the same as the old shit? There have been some. The Carnation Revolution in Lisbon in 1974 ended fascism in Portugal. But only when the dictator had died. And the army had decided the night before not to fire. So it was going to be all right. But it did happen. And it happened quite suddenly. <clears throat> On the other hand, Liberté, the title of one of Paul Lenoir's poems that was dropped by the RAF in special military editions parachuted over occupied France in 1980 and 1942, Liberté, Freedom, Liberty, is slightly expensive brand of yoga. That's it. Wonderful. Thank you, Alfred. I have to stay here. Well, um, yes. Yes. Your, your, your funny light sides remind me of uh, the suggestion that you shouldn't call it sick, that you should call it well. <laughs> I'm feeling very well today. Yes. So I'm not coming to work. Yes. <laughs> well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Malcolm was keen for me to open it to the floor immediately, so does anyone have any questions from Malcolm? Well, I think of something. Oh, I can think of it. Because <laughs> we have another sort of 15 minutes of Q&A with both Malcolm and um, Malcolm. I'm, I'm very glad I put in a word for aestheticism. I identify with it very strongly as an artist. But I'm also aware this is a much broader issue than something that all academics and intellectuals currently face. Because the world has become so commodified now that everybody has to provide a market justification for their existence. And yet, you know, the very core of what's made our civilization is freedom, the think. Because you're a scientist, a mathematician, a philosopher, all these people are thinking because that's what interests them. It's essentially the same as this. It's something going in here. And thank you for saying that's all I'm saying. I, I think I was probably very lucky because I was an art student at Chelsea from 1967 to 71, which was a very optimistic time. Yes. And apart from it was just off the King's Road, and that was all very nice, and so on. And it was nice music playing in the studios all day, and um, whatever. There was an extraordinary feeling that it was going to get better. <clears throat> and that all got broken somewhere in the 70s. And it got done, partly through hard tracks, actually, but for lots of other reasons, too. But I don't forget that. I'm still grateful for the experience. And it's still very much part of me, but I'm not going to let go of it. Yes. You know, that's going to be almost the last thing that goes. Um, and I made it clear I'm not going to a cab and going over into the sea or whatever instead. But I mean, it's going to be right up to the last moment. That sense. It's a kind of utopianism, I suppose, but that, that word gets a bad press. It's a sense that there not only could be a better life, and should be, but can be. And that some of that starts in you. But the big problem, and it's another occupational hazard that will never be solved, is uh, people argue endlessly all night and three in the morning about this. Do you have to change yourself before you change the world? Because if you don't, you'll simply reproduce all the nonsense, which is in you. But if you do that, will the world still be there when you've got round to it? Um, yeah, there isn't an answer. That's what you'll, you'll be debating yourself all your life, it seems, from yes. the point. So. Yes. But having, I mean, my career went through lots of different areas and, and so on, lots of stuff about the cities and what have you, but I'm coming very much back to aesthetics now, because it's meaningful to you. And if you're working creatively, and I regard writing as a creative practice, including academic writing, it needs to be meaningful. Otherwise, what gets you to the end of the day? You're still doing it. 
So there is a kind of economy there, but it's not, um, it's not one that's been imposed or commodified or bureaucratized or marketized. And I suppose what I found increasingly difficult in institutions was that corporatization, usually in a highly amateurish way, um, which is across almost all universities, so I'm not talking about the one I used to work in, um, which kind of saps the energy. Um, when the press went to Twyford Down, which was one of the big anti-Rhodes camps in the 90s, they found retired schoolmistresses, local shopkeepers, all kinds of villagers, and they found New Age travellers, quite a lot of those. But they seemed to be getting on quite well. And, yeah, there were huge cultural differences and class differences, massive class differences. But the single issue campaigning, animal rights would be another one, did seem to bring people together in a way that the, the conventional politics never had. It ten, that tended to say you know, this camp or that camp or the centre. Gradually the centre got to be the biggest thing that all the parties tried to occupy to the point that there wasn't very much difference between them in some people's view. But where the politics is about one issue, many of those other things get suspended for a while. They come back, they're not put out forever. People don't change their class background because you, know, you can't change who your parents were and so on. That, that, that's given. But they did find they could have interesting, meaningful type conversations with people they might have been quite offended by otherwise or frightened by. And they did realise that actually there was some goodwill there. Now, I, being an optimist, well, I don't know if... I, I'm not sure I am an optimist. I think I'm a really deep pessimist. But that's so scary that you have to become an optimist because you just live a better life if you do that. Um, otherwise, you'd never go out. Uh, um, I, being an optimist, I think probably some of those kinds of contacts around particular campaigns, fracking will do this all over again, um, do open up minds to positions they wouldn't otherwise have thought about. That doesn't mean they'll necessarily agree with everything, of course, but it does free it up a little bit and get away from some of the stereotyping. Now, again, you could say that small, localised, ephemeral won't last. Yeah, sure. I have no defence against that. And, and I don't know what will happen. If we're quick, I can give you... Question um, about, I think what you're saying is that, in a way, aesthetics or art, shall we say, that might be beautiful can be instrumentalized at the service of direct action. That seems to be what you're saying. And I'm kind of querying that because there's always a question mark about the instrumentation of art at the service of anything, particularly if it's described as beautiful. So I wanted to ask you what you think that effect is. It is, is it a heightening or symbolic? Well, how do you think art or aesthetics through beauty can affect direct action? It, it, can, I just, sorry, can I just ask you to be reasonably quick because we're slightly over time? Yeah. It, yes, I know I do go on. Um, if I said beauty can be instrumentalized, I'd have to revise what I said because I wouldn't believe that. Um, putting it like that makes me need to think again. Um, but what I would say is autonomy has been crucial to modernism, for example. Modernist art, literature, music claims autonomy, claims to be separate from the conditions of the rest of the world, from perception and so on. That's why we have the white-walled art gallery with the isolated artwork and so on. But that can also be a critical distance standing back. The problem is, can you square the circle of standing back and being engaged at the same time? That, I think, is probably what most of these groups are trying to do. But it's not for me to say. It's more for you to say. Um, I don't know. I think, I think well, beauty is, I don't know, it's, it's the thing that keeps people watching and it it's the thing that you can't pin down and beauty is the thing 
that makes an artwork evocative of m many, many things. And I don't know, it's like, um, in our work, we always try to make something which is open to many interpretations. So, but beauty, you know, we're also seeking to have something which has aesthetics, otherwise you, you can't project yourself into that world. So beauty has this kind of function, really, to bring people in to something onto which they can then project. But um, that projection has to be open enough to be... I but actually then, think... Sorry. But then the choice of subject matter is it's in itself, I think, a, a political decision. This is a <laughs> very I was going to say, I think, I think uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful uh, question to leave it on. Uh, for mm. further discussion over a drink. Um, so... Because art is not meant to be useful. That, that was really important. And I'm not sure that's gone away. Yes, so I'd just like to say thank you very much, Malcolm. <laughs> and Helen. <laughs>